Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Rowan Williams from uh, the uh, Singapore Centre uh, on Environmental Life Sciences Engineering. Um, uh, and it's a real pleasure uh, for me to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Yehuda Cohen from, from CELSI, from uh, the, the centre I just mentioned. Um, uh, Yehuda, uh, uh, his, uh, Yehuda was born in Israel and his, uh, he obtained his PhD uh, from the uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem Medical School in, in medical microbiology. Uh, and then he, he did something uh, quite different. He went and worked at a, um, a, uh, a marine microbial uh, a research station on the Red Sea. And so this was the start of his, his uh, uh, career in, in environmental uh, microbiology, uh, and he's he's um, uh, he's made some very uh, great contributions to this field. Uh, he worked uh, uh, in the Max uh, Planck system in Germany, and he's uh, contributed to uh, the Woods Hole uh, microbial diversity uh, courses on a number of occasions. And he's he's worked at NASA on um, on the biology of uh, microbes in extreme uh, extreme conditions. Uh, and he, he was also the president of the, the International uh, Society uh, of, uh, of uh, Microbial Ecology um, uh, fairly recently. Um, so in, in 2009, uh, Yehuda uh, came to Singapore uh, on leave from, from the Hebrew University and uh, along with Stefan Kellerberg set up this, this very exciting new centre, uh, CELSI, which um, I'm sure he's going to tell uh, something about, but I mean, I, the. One of the exciting things about this centre is it blends uh, sort of basic and, and applied research or translational research uh, in a very, very interesting way and uh, related to the, the role of, uh, of uh, bacterial biofilms and, and complex microbial communities and, and applying those, um, uh, applying with applications in areas as diverse as public health and environmental engineering. So, um, and also say on a, on a more informal note that Yehuda's an excellent cook, although I, unfortunately no <laughs> one's going to, I don't, hopefully not, you know, you're not going to find out about this today, but uh, I'd highly recommend it. And uh, so, um, I'll, uh, I'll stop talking and uh, invite Yehuda up to um, give the next presentation. Thank you, Yehuda. Uh, thank you, Ron. Um, so uh, I must confess it's another first time for me uh, as a microbiologist, molecular biologist, to be in this audience. Um, I get a lot of energy from, from this audience, and I hope I'll be able to reciprocate with a little some new ideas that really is becoming very dominant in microbiology to start with, overall in biology which really talks, if, if I to connect to the previous talk, I, you don't have to be an Einstein to make an impact as an individual. Even a bacterium, an individual bacterium, can make a great impact, provided it has something to give to, uh, to the society. And so the fact that microbes, which are conceived to be the most primitive, the most boring, the most rudimental form of life, have actually complex social life, is not well established, and, but it's very quickly becoming very much established. So, I... Does it work? Do I do something wrong? <laughs> okay. When we say microbes, this is more the image that jumps to our eyes. A small sack of uh, enzymes moving around in space, and you know, a bit boring, kind of. And how, how could you expect any social life from such a minute creature? But we have to remember that such this creature is a cubic micron. When you are a cubic micron, then 
life on your own as an individual in the environment is difficult. There's a lot of advantage of being together, which I'll try to slowly explain why and how. Uh, but, uh, so we thought that this is basically the microbial life. Very tiny, but many individual cumulatively contributing to the biosphere that uh, has been generated that support us and maintaining it ever since. So they play a very major role. But we now very quickly realize that they don't do so in this mode of life. Uh, <clears throat> so the microbial world is actually the impact of all these, the cumulative impact of microbial life is generating the biosphere that, that allowed the evolution of life and the evolution of higher organism, uh, of which we are, of course, the most uh, developed form. But what I want to tell you at the end of the day, that we are not much more than just a walking biofilm. And Along with us are thousands of bacteria with very complicated social life, and they govern our life in a, in a way that only now we slowly understand the importance of that. Uh, so in order to, to really understand this, we have to think how the world looks if you are a cubic micro. If you're in a cubic micron, then the physics of your environment is somewhat different. Uh, for us, uh, where we are more or less in these dimensions, uh, if we want to collect some resources from the environment to make a living, we have to actively move over, collect these resources, bring them over here, and make a living. Uh, there's always the possibility that if, 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 assuming we are all living in aqueous environment, because most bacteria do, so let's assume that this is all an aqueous environment, an alternative method would be just to wait for diffusion to transport these resources, let's say soluble glucose, from the end of the swimming pool to us. If we have to wait for the diffusion to do it, we will be starving. But if you are a cubic micron, diffusion processes are fast enough that they actually govern your life. And this is what drives microbes. They really want to maximize diffusion. They, their goal of life is to identify gradients in nature and maximize the resources that can, they can grow with. And if you are an individual, you will have to keep moving around in search for these natural gradients. Moving around when you are a cubic micron is extremely energy. Um, uh, it costs a lot of energy. We can compare it as if we would have to swim in a pool of honey. I mean, to, to get from point A to point B under this viscous environment would be really a tremendous investment of energy. And that is for an organism in the size of a bacterium to move around needs a, a tremendous investment of energy. There's no inertia. So the moment that the flagella, which is a very sophisticated motor that allows the bacteria to move around, stop moving, it will stop. So for an individual bacterium to make a living, it has to continually, continuously search around for these natural gradients and uh, sort of use these natural gradients to get the natural resources to build up their life. Uh, so the physics is, I mean, the, 
I said before that the, the, the environment of, of the, the microbes is the entire world, but it's actually the, let's say, 100 microns around the cell. It's that sphere where the fusion is fast enough that will sustain the growth of, of, of the bacterium. As long as the fusion is in the order of seconds, this is very relevant to uh, acquiring resources. Uh, and as I said, unlike us, for a microorganism, it, it's a very viscous environment, very tough life for the individual. And the only way for the organism to really find the gradients around is to keep moving around in hundreds of microns, and that is very costly. But this is sort of the mode of life similar to the nomad human life in the desert, where you are trying to make the most of the very little resources around you. You have to invest quite a lot in moving around. And the gain is uh, sort of fairly low. There is an alternative. And the alternative is to stick together. Once these individuals form an aggregate, they can impact their environment. That is something they cannot do as long as they are a cubic micron. But when there are 100 individuals, then you can impact your environment. You can change the steepness of the gradient by having very efficient transport mechanism. You can assure that the concentration of your limited growth factor will be close to zero at the cell wall. And hence, you would create the steepest gradient and hence the fastest flux to the environment. And that is of a major advantage because you don't have to keep migrating around looking for these uh, gradients. And furthermore, whoops, uh, you could, uh, having much steeper gradients, you will have a much uh, faster flux of resources from the environment. And no wonder that the old, I mean, as you all know, I'm oh, sorry, so let's just say few uh, sort of summary of what I said so far. So for a bacterium to go through life and make the most out of it, it has really to identify environmental gradients and acquire these resources. And as an individual, it is limited. The single cell, therefore, has to move around continuously. And when aggregating together, you can impact your environment, generate steep gradients, allow a higher flux, high diffusion fluxes. Once you increase them, then, of course, the, you, you will eventually exhaust these resources. So they'll be short-lived. Namely, you will have to continuously generate new type of gradients. So the optimal mode of life for a bacterium is A, being together, B, generating gradients and continuously changing these gradients. So the optimal mode of life is very different from the way we conceived life as, as sort of the most successful evolution we would expect to find in an environment which is constant over a long time that would allow the accumulation of all the um, impact of the individuals on the uh, community. Uh, <coughs> so, but to be able to act together, you have to acquire a lot of tools which the individual bacteria doesn't have to have. And indeed, these uh, uh, migrants that move around in the ocean freely have the smallest genomes among the bacteria. And as I will give you some examples, 
those bacteria that have developed to have a very complex social life have one of the largest genomes. It takes a lot of different capabilities to be able to efficiently communicate uh, with your uh, members of the community and to actually achieve a more efficient mode of, of life. And so we are now shifting our understanding of the mode of life of a bacterium from where we were not too long ago here to where we are now. And this is primarily because there was a very outstanding Nobel laureate in the beginning of the 20th century, Robert Koch. And he, he said he was a very important uh, microbiologist in the development of medical microbiology. He said in order to identify the cause of a disease, you have to isolate a bacterium from your natural sample, study it in pure culture in the laboratory, and eventually be able to induce the disease on a host, and then you show the direct correlation of this. This was a major, major achievement for medical microbiology and a complete disaster for microbial ecology and microbiology alone because by studying the bacteria in Q culture as individual member rather than in the community, all of this eluded us for many years. And this is the uh, default mode of life of bacteria. It's much more complex than we would have ever. And, and no wonder this this morning when you wanted to give an example of, of a mode of life where the individual doesn't matter. You say, okay, a bacterium, they're all cloned because we have learned to really take this isolated bacterium and from one cell develop a real big culture and we learn a lot from this approach. And we have developed many different models and really with very efficient uh, uh, advance of, of microbiology ever since, but all of this really was lagging behind. So today we do have new technologies that now allows us to really look in the community in its entirety. And we have to understand that bacteria being the oldest mode of life on Earth as we know it, the oldest fossils already appear in a biofilm mode. So, meaning that if you look in these oldest fossils, they look like this, and if you look more carefully, they are already arranging themselves with a, a certain 3D architecture, indicating that it matters, indicating they relate to each other. Uh, indicating that this oldest fossils as we know it today, indicate that this biofilm mode of life is indeed a very ancient one. And this is how we find them today in marine uh, biofilms along the coast of Eilat. This is during the time I was working on the dead, on the Red Sea, and you could see all of these filamentous cyanobacteria like these micro-tropical jungle that really support life there. And you look here and look, this is, let's say, 300 square micrometers. We see only one type of phototrophic bacteria, cyanobacteria. Okay? It's a unique group because they have enough morphology that you could tell just by the picture that there are different types. And we find many different types in one tiny little space. How come, what is the evolutionary advantage of having so diverse uh, 
distribution of organisms which all have very similar physiology in a very well-defined microenvironment. Again, I, I, I'm ashamed to admit, but we biologists, we don't even have a good definition of what is the biological definition of, of, of a species of a bacterium. The only definition that we use today is a statistical one. We say, okay, we extract DNA from one bacteria, we extract DNA from the other bacteria. If they are more than 70% identical, they belong to the same species. Why 70%? Why not 75? Why not 65? What's, I mean, there is something about, I mean, today there are definitely hundreds of thousands, if probably much more than that, of different species of bacteria. And on the, in this very tightly aggregate organism, there is a constant ex horizontal exchange of genes. You would expect the evolution of one superbug that will do everything. It hasn't happened. And, but why do we find such a diversity in such an aggregate? I don't know. As you can see here, they really enjoy living together. But they keep their territory. Each group comes with its own aggregate, next to another aggregate, and next to another aggregate. But there is something about keeping your own territory, which is key. Again, some basic concepts we are really don't, don't know. In other uh, aggregates where there's not enough morphology, as it is the case in, in cyanobacteria, we can use various molecular tagging and actually see the same thing, that you have different types of uh, bacteria in an aggregate now using different tags. So there is something very important that controls the architecture and which probably has a, an important impact on its uh, function and its cumulative metabolism. So I just wanted to, to, to tell here that indeed biofilms seem to be the default mode of life for a bacterium. This is the hotspot of microbial life. And life it does occur in hotspots especially when you are a bacterium. And <coughs> they are, a lot of them are free living, and a lot of them are associated with any higher organism. So another major emphasis in these days in microbiology is that of the uh, microbiomes, namely understanding the interrelation of the microbes that we carry along with us in our well-being. And again, a lot of the individual medicine will have uh, to depend on specific individually different interrelation of each of us with a somewhat different individual biofilms that we carry through our lifetime. And sometimes we treat them badly when we take an overdose of antibiotics or whatever. For bacteria to be together, they must develop the proper linguistics. They have their Esperanto, which is every bacteria can understand, and they have their slang, which only that particular strain of bacteria can understand. These signals are continuously uh, produce and conceive within the environment, and there is a, and the chemistry of which we try to understand now. And by understanding the chemistry, we can inter interfere with this communication and block the communication that would lead to a process that we want to eliminate, and we can enhance a process that we would like to 
uh, enhanced, such as the degradation of toxic compounds in the environment, for example. Uh, and so this is really key. So biofilms and planktonic life sort of interplay. There is a, a biofilm cycle. Uh, we start to understand several factors controlling the cycle. Uh, here, I would like to depict sort of the importance of uh, phages, which are within the community, and once in a while, they burst, they lie the, the central part of the biofilm, and then individual planktonic cells start moving around, and they will inhabit other environments. A biofilm is a very complex society. It has, uh, it, oops, it has to take care of importing of food in, of exporting all the waste. There's a lot of signals going on there, and these signals, I mean, not all of them really uh, result in actual um, uh, function or uh, new function because there is a hierarchy of all these signals, the nature of which we're still really far from understanding. There is a continuous threat of a biofilm by various predators. Uh, <coughs> as you see here in the form of protozoa, the lovibria are just predatory bacteria, and these phages, all of them, try to get hold of these biofilms, they are a very concentrated source of, of food. But a biofilm is a very good uh, way for bacteria to avoid predation. In our systems, when we develop biofilms, such as is the case in, in uh, patients of cystic fibrosis, the biofilm is at least three orders of magnitude more resistant to antibiotics than would be the individual form. So the bacterium has the capacity really to shield um, uh, the bacteria from predation and <clears throat> to shield them from being affected by various toxins. So if we are trying to really uh, use various uh, antiseptic agents, uh, where there is uh, a bit of biofilm around, often we will just kill the outer uh, layers of the biofilm, but a lot of it will retain and will persist and will then become chronic, be it in the environment, and hence we can generate tremendous engineering problems, such as corrosion, for example, on, on pipelines, in medical arena, in many fields, and uh, so this is really the key. In a biofilm, you have, because you have different bacteria associated there, you generate gradients within the biofilm which continuously change and really allows the, a more optimal way for the bacteria to grow. Uh, we can visualize this if we now introduce some dyes that will fluoresce as a function of oxygen. And if we take such a biofilm under the microscope and we have these fluorescent tag, and we can see that we have these flow chamber, these are the biofilms. Here you have the medium coming in and coming out. And, and you could see that with increasing flow, you can control the availability of oxygen, you control the, the uh, gradients within the system. And here it is very important to understand because you can look in a biofilm as analog of uh, a real tissue. But if you, we, all we know from developmental biology, we take an embryo of a drosophila, there is a, a sort of a line of events that would occur what, sequentially that will eventually have generated a well-developed drosophila. Here, the sequence of events are determined by environmental clues. So this is much more plastic. 
and, and hence it's much more complex. It's, uh, <clears throat> and it is very important to understand these environmental gradients and the interrelation of the various functions as they occur within the biofilm. So you, you could really follow the dynamics of oxygen supply into the system and understand uh, the, the changes of the gradients and follow up the changes of a set of functions which are being turned on and turned off as an, uh, uh, an effect of these changing gradients. So, <clears throat> first of all, biofilms often carry co-metabolism. So, some components will uh, basically oxidize, let's say, a complex organic one at one step, and it will then be taken further by the next one, and then further by the other. And there is a very delicate metabolic interactions that results that such a biofilm is so much more effective in the overall bioprocess. Uh, furthermore, as I was trying to depict by these moving uh, black and, and, uh, and red dots, they are all continuously secretion of various signals. And uh, they keep changing all the time. And each signal cannot stay for too long. It has to address a particular set of conditions at a particular given of time. So it is produced and, and destroyed very quickly. And so there is a continuous um, bombardment of various signals, which will eventually result in the differentiation, namely that the cells that form, so this is a biofilm produced by one specific model organism. But the organism that produced the cap of this and the organism producing the stem are very different. And there is a differentiation process going on which is governed by all of these environmental changes. So, for some bacteria, I mean, they must really work together to make a living, as it is the case in Myxococcus, because Myxococcus make a living out of degradation of cellulose. Cellulose is not dissolved in the environment. They have to go as a herd to engulf a piece of cellulose and then excrete some enzyme degraded and then it's very important that they move together, and indeed they do so. As you can see here, there is a, a, a movement which is well coordinated. Furthermore, we can isolate those leaders which really uh, generate new passes and those that follow the herd, and we can identify them molecularly and say what sort of... Uh, uh, a gene is needed for a leader versus uh, a, a, a group of bacteria to just follow the leader. And we can mutate them and see how it's actually affecting the social behavior. So we can start considering sort of molecular sociology, which is, is a bit... Uh, Strange. Here you have another very interesting uh, example. This is a fairly early example. This is a very common marine planktonic organism. Usually it has one flagella. It moves around with all the problems I told you before. But once it finds new surfaces, then things change very, very quickly. It, all of a sudden it develops many flagella all over. It starts warming, and in the process, it sheds all of these flagella, and there is something in the flagella there that prohibits any other bacteria to settle. So they have declared this territory theirs. And, and once this has happened, no other bacteria can settle. 
And again, the molecular nature of this is, is really interesting for various applications. Another very interesting story, again, the sociology of this Myxococcus. So Myxococcus lives as vegetative cells, as herd that I tried to show you before, engulfing um, the cellulose, degrading it, until cellulose become limiting. Once cellulose become limiting, then this is happening. What do you see here? This is now the production of fruiting bodies. So when resources become limited, then you have to consider the next generation. It is a very interesting process. So some cells in the process goes to a complete lysis. They are altruistic. They sacrifice themselves for others that would further develop and form spores. These lytic cells will then form the, so these are the fruiting bodies that you see them. These are the, the uh, synchronized movements of the cells. And so within the community, you now generate the social pressure to sacrifice yourself for the few that should develop into spores and, and continue with the uh, sort of spreading the genes of, of this uh, particular species. There are mutants that resist this social pressure. And we can easily isolate bacteria that would not lies even though there is the so-called social pressure, which we can identify in very clear molecular tools. So they keep aggregating, and so and, and at, when this is done, there is this agent which really, uh, when at high concentration, will really cause the cell to get lysed, and there are the evolution of individual that will resist that. But that can hold only when there is a certain percentage of this resistance, where there is too many of them, then the entire community collapse because then the fruiting body does not happen. So there is a very delicate uh, evolution here. We could really understand the, the molecular nature of this. So these are the cells that actually have lysed and generated the stem, on top of which you have the mix of spores. And it's very important to have, because they, they are found in, in forests, and it's important to have these fruiting bodies elevated from the ground, then moving animals then just will distribute these spores in a distance that would be efficient without the the stem cells, this whole distribution process will not be efficient. Biofilm has also a very important additional factor, and it always is embedded in a polymetric matrix, in a polymeric matrix. So it's not just aqueous environment. So all these signals are actually mediated through a polymeric matrix, uh, which contain a lot of exopolysaccharides, uh, a lot of external DNA, proteins. We don't fully understand, the, and the expert on this is here among us, uh, Hans Stuart Fleming. We are trying to understand all these communication occur in a matrix which keep changing all the time. It goes from soul gel transformation. It keeps changing, and all these signals, the, the lifetime of these signals are also affected by all these changes that would occur. Uh, so it will have all these external DNA. It will have many different proteins. I mean, the, the, we can now develop tools to really look into the process of polarization and one of the uh, 
fact, one of the researchers in Celsi is actually looking into these. Uh, uh, how do I get this to show? Yeah. yeah. So he, he could actually look into the way this polymerization process goes on and how it is affected by availability of calcium ions and so on and how that, oops, sorry. Please turn off your mobile. Your <laughs> I thought I did. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, as I said, this uh, transformation from biofilm to plankton sometimes is governed by lytic cycles or phages. We start to understand that there are some uh, chemicals that can literally interfere with this communication, as it is the case with nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide has many functions in biology. Among others, it can easily enhance dispersion of biofilm. Uh, <coughs> so it's, it's a really complex system. It has, in addition, nanowires, meaning that there are actual electron transports that may go through this biofilm in centimeters. So bacteria that are far apart, centimeters apart, may communicate by uh, sort of channeling electrons between them in a manner we don't fully understand. My colleague back in, in the Hebrew University has recently beautifully identified nanotubes that connects bacteria of many different types, like gram-positive and gram-negative, through which you have proteins actually moving around. So there are many communication systems we don't fully know yet, but they, you could see here actually by using uh, bold immune labeling, the actual uh, transfer of uh, big proteins across these nanowires. Uh, <coughs> and you have these, as I said, connecting E. coli and Bacillus subtilis, which are very, very different types of bacteria. So we have to move now from using models to working with a bit more complex model, as it is the case here with the multi-species biofilm, which is, you see here, we have three different species that we grow presently in Celsi, uh, separately and together. And we can now try to understand their interrelations. But we have to move now from working with defined models that were basically an outcome of, of the postulate of Koch, uh, to working with the community. And because it is within the community that we will really understand the function of, the, of the, this core metabolism. And again, following the, the, uh, the talk earlier today, I mean, some of my colleagues in Jerusalem could easily show that, uh, again, a, a great example of, of the contribution of an individual bacteria is in what we call persisters. So assuming we will take a, a microbial community subjected to antibiotics, the un even in suspension, if you would have some bacteria that would not grow at the time of exposure to this antibiotic, they will not be affected. And once you finish this exposure to the antibiotics, the so-called persisters that were there and did not grow at the time of exposure because they had a particular set of information, will now, uh, once you, you remove this, this, uh, this antibiotics, will now flourish and will develop a new type of, of a community which will often be res 
when going through many cycles, will develop multiple antibiotic resistance. But understanding biofilm, we don't have to look into more antibiotics of killing the bacteria. We can just interrupt their communication and convince them gently uh, to shift from one mode to the other. And in doing so, why is it so important to do it gently? Because we don't want resistance to be developed. And if we stress them with, with uh, antibiotics that would kill them, definitely there, there is a resistance. This is a major problem these days in medical microbiology. If we use an antibiofilm approach, then uh, you will just disperse the biofilm, and once dispersed, we can treat it easily with conventional methods. So uh, this is, you know, we are trying to address this rather complex set of questions in this uh, recent center of excellence of CELSI that uh, was established here at NTU in collaboration with NUS. And I'm very glad that this is the first time this is working very well. Uh, and that really allows us to look into this, I think, very important mode of life, very basic mode of life from a top-down approach. And Rowan is a very prominent member of this approach, which is led by Professor Stefan Schuster. These days, we can sequence the entire community. We know exactly what is the potential within the entire community without having the need to isolate each one of them. And furthermore, we can go one step further and with the help of some great experts, develop some beautiful RNA libraries and then see which of this potential is being expressed under given conditions of the community. We can really do things that Nobody did before. And so the first thing we did as, when, as, as a center, we went to the municipal wastewater system developed by, that is maintained by PUD. The engineer said, come on, this is the most boring system. It has been optimized to death by all engineers. What can new things come out of this? Uh, I mean, it has been you know, optimized for many generations by now. We don't have answers, but we have start to have questions that could have never asked before. And we can identify traits which I'm sure will revolutionize in the future the wastewater treatment. Just one example. Uh, because we can go further. We can really look into the proteomics of the system and see how this RNA is translated into new proteins, how the actual metabolomes or the communal metabolism change with changing the environment. Because as I said, all of this community is governed by the environment. And so this is one cluster. The cluster below looks into the mechanism that control this differentiation process, understanding the chemistry of the linguistics, uh, understanding how to select anti-biofilm uh, um, uh, uh, treatments, uh, understanding the very basic nature of this mode of growth, and we are trying to apply these technologies into various environmental samples, as it is the case with the full wastewater treatment here. And we will do this in a big way in the medical arena. And, and here again, it's extremely promising. I mean, this cluster, which is led by Professor Mike Gisco from Denmark, has already found that most probably in arteriosclerosis, where you have these plaques developing in your arteries, this is the body's reaction 
to the development of bar films in the artery. So, and this is just, you know, the, the tip of the iceberg. I'm, I'm sure there's quite a lot. So, this is what we are trying to really look by using top-down approach and bottom-up approach into the environment and into the public health issues. And altogether, we are trying to come up with uh, our mission is to really have the understanding of what makes biofilm tick. This is a very basic question. It's a very complex question. We have to shift our mind from working with isolated models to working with the complex community as such. That is of a major problem for biologists. We all grew up in a hypothesis-driven uh, experiment. We have the possibility to actually do experimental evolution. We can take a community and see how it actually changed from A to B, but it's, it's a very complex uh, approach. And again, thanks to colleagues like Rowan and others, I, I start thinking that you could do research without having a hypothesis-driven uh, approach. And just look and see the you know, how the parameters assemble together and get from them some sort of insight which is, because we don't really know. As you can see, there is many interactions going simultaneously in a bar film. Eventually, we want to control the overall process. Uh, we have presently very minor knowledge of very few steps, the rest totally unknown. And this is a beautiful thing, you know, and, and I, I would just end up by telling a little anecdote about my first interaction with the, with the head of our governing board that was assigned to be Peter Ho, which I'm sure many of you know. And when we were first told that he should be governing, I said, what do we have in common? I mean, he has been working in international relation and, and uh, in intelligence, in defense, it was marvelous because what he's doing all his life is a complex system approach and what we are trying to do is the same. I've learned a lot from him and I think it is vice versa. So I'm very glad to have this opportunity to bring some ideas to you. It's kind of a, you know, a bit, a it's the first time for me, I must say, and I thank you for the opportunity and I'll be very happy to answer questions. Yeah, in this uh, conference of complex systems, uh, I fully agree that this really belongs here. And let me elaborate a little on, on the dimensions that you're projecting here. So we are, in our society, very much concerned about the environment. And we're, we're proud to gather a lot of information about all the species out there, protecting these species from eradication and so forth. What we have been overlooking immensely is that more than half of all biological material out there is in the invisible world, in the world of microorganisms. And now you start to illustrate to us what, what this, this world entails. And this is absolutely stunning. I happen to be well familiarized with that because I'm on the board of the Craig Venter Institute. So we have the global ocean sampling, starting to tap into looking at what's in our oceans. And, uh, so what you find, so, and as you emphasize, today we have uh, identified about 6,000 species of microorganisms. There are probably 6 million, something out there. There's so much unknowns out there, and so much, uh, what you illustrate beautifully, collaboration between uh, all these little actors in this, and, and, and this is biofilm, just one example. 
But let me add to you that there's one more dimension that is overlooked. What I'm lacking when I see your center here is where are the virologists? Because you have microbiomes, but besides that you have virobiomes. Mo many of the genes that we find in the oceans are viral genes and not microbial genes. And these genes, uh, of course, we talk briefly about horizontal transfer and lysis of cells and so forth. But here's an other world. On top of the, of the tree of life is a whole cloud of viruses. And what they do, we know nothing about. We can just calculate that in the oceans there are 10 up to 24 uh, virus particles. That is 10, 10 times more than all the stars in the universe. So you have one more dimension to this beautiful world that you're illustrating to us. I, I couldn't agree more to what you just said. I mean, it's, uh, but if we know little about the microbes, we know even less about the viruses. So it, 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 it will come, it must come, because it is well integrated. But, uh, you know, we, we don't know where to start. Talk and when about you complexity. Yes. This is complexity. So, W when you say six million species, what does it mean? H how can you really draw any conclusion of this in the lack of a biological definition of a species? What is there that maintains species and allow the evolution of species over time among bacteria, which are very different, I mean, in, in their genetic... Uh, uh, capabilities. They are much more uh, plastic. And yet, as you rightly said, there are numerous uh, species which live next to each other. So if you recall that slide of many different cyanobacteria living in one particular environment, each individual is a little bit closer to the neighbor or in the middle of, it lives in a slightly different environment and can express an information which is different and it is important to the environment. So even if you're a bacterium, you can make a difference. You don't have to be an Einstein to do so. And there's even one more dimension to this, and that is, as you say, we can't even define the species. But it's even harder than that. We can't even define life. Because we have, these are kind of artificial definition of cellular life and so forth. But in the end, what we are after is to understand which are the actors in evolution. That is the only final denominator. And if we have such a definition, then we include cellular life, we include viruses and so forth, and all the way down to, to viroids that it doesn't even contain a gene and still influence this whole system. Uh, I, I just have to emphasize that because it's a beautiful, complex system for anyone to study who wants to uh, look at the new frontiers. And the, the exciting and at the same time frightening notion is already now you can start doing experimental evolution and you could do synthetic biology and you can experiment with different modes of life. It's very intriguing. It's extremely exciting and frightening at the same time. So. Uh, but we have to face it. I mean, uh, we have to go this way. I mean, if we really want to understand this very basic mode of life, because after all, we, as I said, we are no more than somewhat more advanced biofilm. And we, we have this business close to home. Also. Sorry to take the stage too much. But, uh, we ourselves are walking communities. We're, 10 times more microorganisms in our body than what we have our regular cells. That was alluded to the other day. Uh, what do they do? I mean, uh, by processing the food that we eat, protecting ourselves, other microorganisms attacking our skin and so forth. We need to understand this uh, particular microbiome and the studies that are being made of what, what are the microorganisms, how do they interact, and uh, what do the viruses do? Or if there is room for any amount of new research. A message to all the young people in the audience. Yehuda, thank you for this presentation. You always manage to give it a new touch. 
and uh, I only can uh, uh, agree with uh, what, what is said before. Viruses are important, and I think the big problem is not that the viruses are so complex. The big problem is that there are tribal diff difficulties be the, of, of the language between virologists and bacteriologists. So maybe we can overcome this on this level a little bit easier. And biology is a humble science. As it was said, it cannot define its subject, what is life. It doesn't know where it comes from. We don't know from which point chemistry becomes biology. But back to the biofilms, and I think you painted the picture a little bit too rosy, because what happens in biofilms is hell. It's life and death in biofilms. And you have cannibalism, you have competition of all kinds. And we can even think that the concept of infection has evolved in biofilms. So maybe it's a protected, a highly activated area. And for example, predation in biofilms happens. And there are many protozoa and snails and other organisms which live, uh, which, which make their living from biofilms. And they are re renewating the biofilm. So yeah. maybe the individuals are not so important. Well, while I agree with what you said, but the first biofilms were there long before protozoa and other predators were around. So biofilm has evolved uh, for a selective pressure different of that of protecting the community from predation. And it then they got may bad ideas. still have evolved to be a major uh, step later on, but it's not the primary one. But they have developed ideas to take the neighbor as a fruit, uh, as a nutrient source. Yes. No. Well, Very sure. steep gradient. Yeah. Okay. This is a friendly social <laughs> taking advantage of your neighbors. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, one of the aspects of complexity is uh, the way patterns emerge from, let's say, individual behavior and the way these patterns then change the behavior of the individuals. Now, uh, some 10, 15 years ago, Eshel Ben Jacob did a lot of work, you obviously know, mm -hmm. um, on um, bacterial films and on the morphology that emerges when you change the environment in which the, these bacteria grow. And um, one, one of the things that he discovered is that it's so in so much intertwined that it's sometimes very difficult to find out, you know, who's controlling who uh, in the sense of what the environment controls and what the uh, individual, if you like, controls. Now, if, if you want to use, and this is my question, if you want to use bacteria to, let's say, clean water, um, then this morphology might play a, a very uh, uh, important role because, you know, the, 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 the emerging shape of the total film will have an influence in the, in the activity of the cleaning of the water, which will then have an influence on the shape of the, of the bacterial uh, you know, morphology. So my question actually is, did you, did you look into the morphological aspects of, uh, of uh, biofilms? Yeah, I think we are trying to go there. But uh, I have to admit that presently, we have a problem in, I mean, biofilm by nature is a very patchy system. Um, and in order to be able to understand signals within the system, you have to work in an environment which has reasonably low noise level. And the, the, uh, the, these gross chamber where all of my colleagues grow biofilm in, not, uh, really, I mean, it's, the, this, it's so irreproducible. And each time you get different types of, of of biofilm, it's very difficult to really, without having the proper system to investigate these signals, which will be well above the noise level, there's no way you could go by. This is one fundamental aspect we develop now. Is, and this is the beautiful thing about being at NTU. With all the engineering around, I can consult with engineers on, on Hi, best hydraulics and modeling of that and, and construction of different types of, uh, of gross chamber. And on Friday, we will have a meeting of how do we go about it. And I just came back from uh, 
Carl Zeiss, which really see biofilm as being so important. They, they really want to, to develop new technologies with us and really map the, the distribution of all these chemicals within the biofilm, superimposed on the image, and then see these in, in real time, in action. But that, that calls for, for really adopting existing uh, methodologies and defining our targets for biofilm to be able to really start working it in a, I mean, not having to work with model system as we used to, but working with a complex system, but still in a way which is reproducible. That by itself is not trivial, but we are getting there. And I think once we get this threshold, there'll be some very interesting findings. Because the, the method you mentioned before of my colleague from Tel Aviv, this was on, on a, a culture of, of a particular bacterium in a petri dish as the, the, the colony is developing. And again, it's a beautiful model, and, and we are where we are today largely because most of us were working with models. But as I said, I mean, the, the complexity is not in the summation of the models because there is more than the summation of the models in this complexity. We have to address these questions. I'd like to add to, to the previous question um, because I'm working on different type of cells uh, which are crawling and they're completely different, but they, they, they kind of do the same thing. So for instance, I'm looking at you know, dictyostelum and uh, like slime mold. So they have the exact kind of, you know, same kind of, you know, uh, of social life and they do fruiting bodies and so on. So they're very different. And you can also look all the way to the fish, scrolling fish. So at the end of the day, the key elements are the same. You have mechanical signaling, you have chemical signaling. So I'm wondering if, if we really have to be concerned about all the details in the biofilm. We do. We, uh, there, there is, because, look, uh, I mean, uh, I do believe that, that Darwin was right, and there's one ancestor for all mode of life. But I do believe now more and more that all forms of life have gone through a biofilm mode. And a biofilm has then developed into various eukaryotes and, and to higher metazoans. But so a biofilm is very central to, and having this plasticity of developmental biology, which is not, it is given in, in, in higher organisms, be it zebra fish or drosophila, the zoom for that matter. I mean, now we can really understand the plasticity, which is not controlled by the blueprint, but controlled by various uh, environmental clues. This is key to understanding evolution of higher organism fundamentally, and if we ever want to harness these biofilms, and, and I, I hope I convince you there are good reason to do so, we have to understand the basic mechanisms, and then be able to, to interfere with the communication in the system in order to optimize one process over the other be it for, for degradation of various toxins in the environment or, you know, being able to treat various diseases which these days are chronic and, and cannot be easily overcome by, by conventional medicine. Um, I would like to ask for your opinion on, uh, this is not a marine microbes, but the gut microbes who has been evolving with us for um, centuries. Um, do, the, do you think they have any roles in shaping uh, the way we are now or the other way around? I think by now that there's no question that this is the case. It, we have to refine it now. So I think the question of, of the role of, of these gut microflora to obesity has become more and more apparent. Uh, there are many other topics that will come forward, but we have to be very careful in what sort of data we get. 
because most of the data that we got in the first round was that of, from the fecal pellet. That just is, goes through our system and less intimately connected with us. It is these bacteria which are intimately associated with the gut, which sits on the epithelium and, and has sort of interaction with our body, which are much more important. And, and we have to sample them properly. So sampling so far, we, we, we try to do it in a statistical manner. So we had 500 people giving this diet and other 600 that diet. Isolating primarily the microflora, which is probably not key, okay? Because they are just go through our body. They are not really intimately associated with us. So new pers ecological perspectives of this gut microflora has to be addressed so we can really look in the portion of, of the community which is very relevant. And people are try trying to do so, and, and we see some beautiful questions coming up. No answers yet. Okay? So I, I trust that a lot of the stratified medicine, the sort of the individual medicine, will depend on, on, on these understanding these interrelations and how different are each of us uh, with the, uh, our microflora. But a selective uh, analysis of those which are really important rather than all of it. Uh, thank you for your really stimulating talk. Um, as I'm coming from that talk theory background, I was uh, wondering the, um, your sort of opinion on applying method three to, especially you showed up a presentation and a slide that um, these small bacteria are linked by protein channels that they communicate to. And um, <coughs> if they're in the same biofilm, I'm sort of say same community, they should be linked somehow in some particular pattern and you said, you also mentioned about they were like few folds resistant to antibiotics in, when they're in that sort of form. Um, <coughs> I was just kind of postulating some idea here that if they're linked, because if they're linked in the um, really heterogeneous, they're like, um, the, dis the degree distribution is like scale free, we all know that um, the system never collapsed on the random attack. So that they are really they gain the resistance by just pure structural properties. Um, that's one sort of a aspect that I would uh, like to ask your opinion whether you have tried or what's your thoughts about about that. And there's sort of a new emerging idea of <coughs> interrelated networks themselves, so so-called networks of networks. That I could, I was kind of thinking because I do not know details of bios myself, but it would be plausible to think of a system as the few interrelated networks. First networks of these microbes and networks of the surrounding substrate, the interacting at network levels. That would, I mean, th I think that's sort of interesting real world example because this sort of idea only has been applied to sort of uh, artificial systems like man-built system, power grids, that kind of stuff. But I mean, if this is sort of applied to this biological regime, it would be really interesting. So I, yeah. yeah, so, so l let me start with the question, first question, if I got it right. Uh, yeah, biofilm really is, uh, I mean, bacteria can find refuge in biofilm. That's a fact. We don't really know why. But we start to get some ideas. For example, uh, lately, uh, many bacteria grown in biofilm were shown to develop amyloid. Amyloids are the sort of forms that you find in uh, Alzheimer, which really uh, uh, disturb the, the, the coating of, of, of the neurons in the system. And it is now postulated these amyloids that build up within the biofilm really protect the, the biofilm 
for being uh, attacked by macrophages in, in, our, in our immune system. And, and that is a very nice testable uh, hypothesis. This is presently being investigated and may well turn out to be right. Uh, <clears throat> so, and, and I'm pretty sure that it, it's more complex than that. But I'll just give you one example which is more, which is experiment, can be experimentally approached. As for networking of, of biofilm, yes, we, we definitely want to be there. And this is a key target that Rowan is trying to coordinate by just getting this tremendous data coming out from, from the metagenomics and the metatranscriptomic. We will superimpose it with the architecture of, of the biofilm with understanding the chemistry in the system and eventually get it. We're not there yet. It, it's a long way. And, and as you well understand, it involves major computation uh, problems which have to be addressed and a lot of bioinformatic problems. But we are assembling the, the right experts. And, and again, Rowan is a very key person in assembling these with the hope that eventually we'll be there. Uh, at the target, but it's, it, we, are, we are definitely not close to that yet. But we are identifying the limitation at least. Starting to. Okay, I actually have two questions. Uh, second one is really short. The first one is, are there modular components to these biofilms? Okay. There are modular components to biofilms you've already identified some of which are shared by, say, macroscopic organisms, humans, pigs, dogs, whatever. Uh, so you mentioned communication networks already uh, among the biofilms, and clearly macro animals have that. Are there modular functional components of biofilms that aren't shared by macroscopic organisms, and vice versa? And what does that tell us about sort of general rules of system organization of living things? And then we compare that to functional systems of cities, say, and what does that tell us about systems in general, that for these things to thrive, they need certain functional components, and then certain extra ones are extra or uh, optional? That's the first question. OK, so <laughs> try to. Uh, so when microbial ecology, which is key to understanding biofilm, has been really had a, its own evolution away from macroecology on the one hand and from biology on the other hand. And it's only recently that this, this, the merge is really being done and we try to see what are the general rules in ecology that would be, uh, that can be expressed in, in biofilms, in, in micro, uh, microbial ecology, and whether the a uh, communication system that controls uh, development of embryonic cells in higher organisms follows a similar pattern to that of developmental biology of the biofilm. It's, so we haven't been talking to each other. So we, 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 the researchers, have a communication problem because Last year, I, I attended the uh, mechanobiology meeting, first time ever, and saw that there are a lot of things which they do which is very relevant to biofilm. And I was glad to present the biofilm as, as a platform where these technologies can act. We're just starting that. I mean, the, the ecologists with the great uh, theories uh, have rarely been applied to, to microbial community. And it, it's, uh, <coughs> you know, E.O. Wilson says that if he would have to start the, from the beginning, he would be a microbial ecologist. Because this is where, where the real action is, because you can really do experimental evolution with a community, which you cannot do with a herd of elephants or lions or whatever. I think with this interdisciplinary research, with the development of this platform of, of complex system, I mean, a prerequisite is, is, is this 
cross communication with researchers from other disciplines. So we are trying to develop this nucleus within CELSI, and hopefully that will eventually propagate to, to others, and, and because we are talking of very interdisciplinary, by, by proposing comparison, you, you are referring to, to interdisciplinary research. And, and uh, not too many people feel comfortable enough to stick their head out of their comfort zone where they are the world expert and into an environment where they have to admit that they know little of and, and still find the right language to communicate with the expert in the other field. We are trying to promote that and I'm sure we're not the only one and it, it will eventually evolve but it's just the beginning. There was a second one. <laughs> yeah. Someone over here. No, you, you have the second one. Second question. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, you have a second question. Right. Okay. Short and easy. So, given the difficulty sorry. of defining bacterial species, uh, you know, humans like to bend things in nice, discrete categories that are clean, but Clearly, this is not working for bacteria. It doesn't really work for horses and mules and donkeys, even. But for bacteria, certainly not. Might there be a better option of describing the genetic diversity than how many species, where species is arbitrarily defined? Might there be a, a different technique? And might that be worth looking into? It, it, it is a, an excellent question, and I think a very central question for the whole field. I mean, um, we are starting to develop the idea that the exact species is not really important. The important is what is the function that this particular form of life is, is, uh, is expressing. And whether it is expressed through species A or species B within a community, it may not be crucial. It is crucial that that type of function is being expressed. So we are moving from being in the old times with taxonomy to moving into phylogeny, which thought people thought that would solve all our problem. It did not because all it, it generated a long list of Latin names of who is there, and people keep asking, so what? Okay? Now, if we look into the functionality of the community, and we say, okay, in order to have this level of nutrification, you have to have these set of genes being turned on along with this type of particular set of environmental conditions. That is maybe more meaningful. Again, I probably will have to change this in, in a year time. I'll, my answer will be different. But this is where we are at the moment. It's also a very, um, I mean, there's a very practical element to that question, which is that, I mean, sure, you, you, can, you can survey all the DNA. And, I mean, this is basically what we artists do in, in, in this, this area, is, is basically survey um, you know, the DNA in one of these communities and then try and assemble. I mean, the, the hope is that you would take, um, you know, the, the short reads of DNA from 2,000 species and try and assemble whole genomes out of that. And it, it's not really clear if that's going to work. And so given that, that most of the species are unculturable and we probably can't assemble uh, whole genomes de novo out of this kind of mix of genomes, then, then this, this view that, that you know, what's the community doing as a whole, or, or some some halfway point between a, a community-driven view and an individual genome-driven view? You know, maybe the, the, the place where where at least the, the practical kind of benefits come from. But you know, that's a, a bit of an open space. So in this uh, in this particular field, we, we start seeing that there are only very few that have a dominant impact and a long tail of, of individuals, the function of which we don't really know. 
whether these individuals make a difference or not on the biofilm, again, I'm coming back to this, we don't know. But it may well be, because it takes one individual to produce a certain antibiotics and then everything changed very quickly. So, so one question here and one question. Yeah. Very short. Uh, I think just referring to your last remark, I think uh, in, in the bacterial world, and in biofilms in particular, private possession of genes is not such a concept. There's much more free exchange of genes. And this may go back to first evolution, which may not come from a common ancestor, but from a common community, with much more free exchange of genes. And that makes the function uh, approach much more attractive. But I have another suggestion, and this is uh, we should just start, uh, stop for two years doing any research and start talking to each other and finding out what the other discipline does. And I think Celsi does a good job in the beginning. This is networking. Um, we, there are so beautiful methods in other disciplines like the mechanobiology or the microscopy at NUS or many others. We, we, we are simply, we don't have enough fantasy to use them. But I think we should do much more networking, much more talking to each but other. This is exactly what we are doing here. So you suggest we should extend this meeting for the next two years? <laughs> I, I know very little about this topic, and I thought like I'll not ask question, except the last question kind of gave me a... Functionality changes very quickly for humans, you know. Sucking milk is our first function, but, you know, we evolve and become terrorists at some point of time, you know. So functionality, defining functionality for microbes, which are evolving faster, much faster than bigger macro, you know, uh, elements, is more, in, in my mind, is more difficult than trying to find out the source, which may be, compl which may be complicated, but, you know, may resolve to really giving you concrete division of, uh, rather than functionality, which within the same structure might evolve. Again, as I said, I have given up, I have never studied biology from grade nine. And so <laughs> this is my, you know, my, my ignorance is. So you see that the functionality within a biofilm is so much more plastic than, I mean, if we take a stem cell, and we can develop it into a nerve cell and into red blood cell. That's, that's basically the spectrum that we can differentiate. But you take a, a bacterium, it, it can evolve into a strictly anaerobic methane uh, producer, or it can be an oxygen producer photosynthetic organism. The biochemistry is very different. We, I mean, as high organisms, we have uh, Biochemistry-wise, boring. I mean, we do the same as yeast do. I mean, we take um, carbohydrates, we burn them using oxygen, we make a living of that. So all of us do the same, and yeast do the same, and that's why we are fairly close. Bacteria are vastly different. So the, the uh, functionality is is much more of a key here because it can culminate in a completely different bioprocess with n not just a small variation of the theme but, but a completely different theme. And, and hence, it's, it's, I think it can be very powerful and maybe more, you know, at the end of the road we could develop technologies which would be really applicable using this type of approach because that is what we want to be able to control is, is the bioprocess of the community. Okay? And whether this is done by species A or species B may not be key. And uh, so far the engineers didn't like microbiologists because they had little, they couldn't handle all the data that we generated which was a long list of Latin names, and so what? Okay, so uh, I think we should wrap it up there and uh, adjourn for lunch.
much and it's a sort of discussion with you, Peter, uh, it's a small second of uh, appreciation from you. Thank you.